good. And I was myself here. Very good. Good afternoon, everyone. And you are the survivors. This is the last session of Jack World 2024. Congratulations. We'll have 60 minutes of entertainment for you, all centered on wind turbines, wind composite material use, and circularity. Uh, my name is Alex. I'm the head of innovation at Wind Europe, which is a trade association for wind energy. We're based in Brussels. And before we delve into the wonderful panel discussion with my esteemed colleagues here, just wanted to set the scene a little bit of uh, where do we stand as the wind industry in Europe today. So right now we have, as of the 31st of December of last year, we have 272 gigawatts of installed capacity in Europe and we provide for 19% of all of Europe's electricity on an annual basis. In the EU27, we installed 16 gigawatts of new capacity last year, which is a record, so that's good. But to meet the climate and energy targets, we need to be installing in the next five years double that on average. So we need to ramp up the production significantly. We think we can do this. We've taken a look at the numbers, we've looked at the orders, we've looked at the supply chain capacity, and the ambition can be matched. We are going to reach those targets. We are confident that we will be installing 30 gigawatts on average in the next years, yeah? Next year, it will not be 30, but at the end of the decade, it will be much more than 30. That's good news for you guys, because that means a lot more composites are going to be needed in our sector. At the same time, we also know that we are seeing the first wave of turbines reaching the end of life. The numbers are still relatively small. Last year, we decommissioned around 750 megawatt of capacity of all turbines. But that presents us with a dual challenge or a dual opportunity when it comes to circularity topics. How do we deal with those end-of-life turbines and the blades that are coming from those turbines that were installed 25, maybe even 30 years ago? How do we recycle them? And how do we make sure that of those 30 gigawatts and more that we'll be installing in the coming years, how do we make sure that those turbines are as recyclable, as circular, circular as possible? That and much more we'll try to answer for you in the next 60 minutes. And I will not be doing it on my own. I have a wonderful panel with me. So thank you. Uh, let's have an applause for the panel while I make my way to the seat. I will. So I will quickly introduce everyone. So immediately to my left is uh, Guillaume Cleda from Arkema. You will all know Arkema as a resin producer. Next to him, we have Matthew Carriou from Gurit, composites producer. Next to him, Live Ole Meyer from Olin Epoxy, epoxy resin manufacturer. Next to him, Alan Paulson from Vestas, one of Europe's leading wind turbine manufacturers. Next to him, we have Tom Wassenberg from Owens Corning, glass fiber manufacturer. And at the end, the man with most suitable last name to any wind panel, Peter Windmuller, uh, from Lucia, uh, who is uh, in our industry known as part of the recycling value chain. Many thanks to everyone. And let me delve straight into the first topic of today, and that is all about the state of the wind industry. And I said we will be using a lot more composites, but Alan, could you enlighten the audience in more detail? Why are we using composite materials? in wind turbines? Yes, uh, I think it's, it's very clear. Uh, we would like to have a light component in top of uh, this long steel pole. Uh, and that is, uh, that is of course, uh, caused by the composites uh, that the, wind, uh, bl the blades are made from. We have a stiffness to mass ratio that it cannot be compared to other materials. Uh, and each time, if we increase the material mass, it's going to, uh, to have a huge impact of the rest of the construction. And then, of course, there's also the, the fatigue that the composites can take. It's, uh, it's uh, tremendously, tre tremendously good and above all other materials. Very good, very clear. I spoke a lot about composites, but I didn't specify which type of composites. In the wind industry, it's mostly still glass fiber reinforced 
polymers. Tom, can you sh shed some light on why that is? Yeah, I think uh, Alan was already talking about the stiffness to uh, um, uh, mass and performance ratio. I think less materials are having a very high performance to cost ratio as well. So that's why the reason is that glass is still used. Certainly one of the limitations might be weight over time with the size of the turbines and that's why the glass industry specifically owns Corning. We have developed higher modulus products over the time so that we can benefit in reducing weight with the same performance through additional performance of our products. But I think this high performance to mass ratio comes actually from the core of composites that we can direct the modulus driving reinforcements in the direction of the structural design which is coming from the OEMs and we can really steer the, the performance of the product in the composites to the loads very much directed which is bringing this high uh, performance to mass ratio from composites into the wind blades. Many thanks Tom. Uh, maybe Alan just a very quick question because Tom hinted here at weight and the blades are getting longer. What is the longest blade you guys at Vestas are working on? Yeah, I think in, in Vestas, the longest blade we have is 115.5 meter and more than 60 tons, and it's made from uh, glass composites, but uh, there's also a decent amount of carbon fiber in such blade. Mm -hmm. Very good. So not only the numbers are increasing installations, those blades, those turbines are getting larger and bigger as well. Talking about scale up, so what do we need to do to make sure that the supply chain can, can meet the, those, those demands. Uh, Mathieu, as, as a composites producer, being here in the center of this value chain, where do you see the opportunities and challenges when scaling up? I mean, we, we, like we talked about just before, like with Tom, we, we are all about performance and, and, and those performance per unit of cost, yes? But a big element, going back on what Alan just mentioned, is also to deploy those materials within such a big piece of, of blade at the end of the day. So being able to uh, deploy those materials within a mold in an efficient period of time to uh, hit the productivity is pretty crucial for us. Yeah? And also, um, the, the way the tooling is used um, the, the lifetime of a, of a tooling is pretty critical at the moment to the industry. Um, we are changing size, but we need to be able to find time to um, enhance those equipment, which are very costly. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Very good. Guillaume, when we are scaling up, yeah, we want to make it as sustainable as well at the same time. So. How do we marry the challenge of investing now in what is available now and making sure that we can deliver, and at the same time, investing in new, innovative, sustainable circular solutions? Yeah, we, we, we are the vision of a, of a chemical company uh, in Arkema, and uh, to, to tackle the, the, the recycling uh, question in the, in the composite industry, and particularly for wind, we consider that to get an efficient recycling strategy, we had to change the material itself and uh, uh, reinvent the, 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 the composite material and the matrix for the composite material, particularly in the adhesives. That's all we come up with the helium resin, a new generation of liquid thermoplastic resin in order to uh, give the opportunity to, uh, to, the, to the composite industry to enable efficient mechanical uh, a recycling uh, strategy, but also some uh, chemical strategy that allow the the the, um, <coughs> the waste management to uh, come back to the old monomer, the original building block of the of the resin, to uh, manufacture again and again the same resin. Very good, Peter. All the way on the other end of the the long long stage here. How do you see that that challenge with uh, with ramping up because if I'm correct, Lucia is predominantly focusing on the end-of-life assets, whereas, of course, Guillaume is scaling up in new circular-by-design uh, blades. You are dealing with those blades that are being turned into end-of-life, uh, coming down of the turbines. How do you see the challenge of scaling up in anticipation of bigger volumes? Um, the volumes are not a problem for us. Um, I believe the challenge will be in 
the mechanical challenge for the manufacturers. As they go wider, it was already mentioned, we go into um, combinations of glass fiber and carbon fiber. And from a recycling point of view, that's going to be a very big challenge with a major M, major challenge, um, because the separation is, is very difficult. When we break down a 120 meter blade to, in the end, 20 millimeter components, um, it is impossible to create 100% clean carbon and 100% clean glass fiber product. So that's a challenge, big. Mm. Life. Looking at the answer that you've heard from your co-panelists, how do you see the industrial pathway forward when it comes to achieving higher circularity? Yeah, from my perspective, there are, there are two key elements to uh, achieve the pathway to, to yeah, basically commercialization, uh, commercialization of those technologies. The number one key element, what, whatever materials you recover, there needs to be a use case. Yeah? And this is, for example, why we believe in, in, in circularity. Yeah? The industries that produce the material need to be able to absorb them and to do something useful with them. Uh, the other relevant uh, uh, aspect to bring those technologies to scale is basically coming from a chemical company. Economy of scale is a, is a huge factor. And this means you need to be able to collect the waste and to centralize it on one side. And, and this is really one of the key elements where I think we as an industry all need to work together to move our associations and to move authorities as well. Very good. And as one of the associations, I can say that indeed that is what we are trying to work on, on how we can improve the collection and also the pooling of composite material waste, uh, at least of those industries, the wind industry and the boating industry, where the composite use or at least the, the original materials are very similar going in there, that at the end of life, they can also possibly be treated in the same way and therefore getting a higher scale of volumes that would help the recycling industries. Um, Peter, coming back to you then, I was talking about recycling industries and, and challenges uh, about sorting and ways, and you hinted at some of the technical uh, parts. Do you see any other challenges or barriers to... to to large-scale recycling of composites? Um, one of the challenges we experienced when we were setting up our facility in, in Bavaria was clearly government regulations. Uh, basically, we faced an attitude of, we don't know what you're doing, we are not going to grant a permit. Uh, extensive discussions, very difficult. Um, another challenge is the low cost of raw materials, of course because when we recycle, we put money into that product and we need to be compensated. Not only we as a machinery manufacturer, but mostly the guy who operates that facility. Um, and the second thing is that any recycling, not only the mechanical, which we're doing, but also thermal or chemical, um, has a huge upfront investment and running operating costs. So what you mentioned before, pooling is extremely important. We need to get away from small, single-minded, single operator, single producer solutions. If I can run 10 tons an hour on my machine, we're talking 15,000 tons per shift a year. Mm. That's more than anybody I talk to here can handle. Mm -hmm. So we need to think about our machine, yes, but also we need to about pooling volumes to make those recycling investments attractive. Very good. Alan, as uh, one of the, let's say, the visual proponents of, of course, wind turbines and composite materials, and then also when they come to the end of life, you get a lot of questions from your clients on this. How do you see this, um, this challenge, this opportunity? Do you see synergies within the own wind energy value chain when it comes to achieving recycling, scaling up circularity? I definitely see synergies. I see attraction in the wind industry at the moment to try to create these circular value chains. But I firmly believe that we need to move also outside the wind industry to get the right volume on it. Because it's, to be honest, it's not the big volume. You won't find them in the wind industry. Yes, we do have huge blades and they're pretty pure 
uh, composites. You know what you get, but if you look into the automotive industry, the uh, electronics industry, uh, there's a lot of other industries where you use composites, and we need somehow to merge these uh, composites so we can get we can get the necessary scale. I think there's been a huge focus from our authorities on the wind industry because we have these huge components, and that has made made us to move. But we need other industries to to move in the same direction as us, and also to have some ambitions because I think it's. It's too easy for some of these industries not to, to I mean, how to say, to, 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 to duck their heads and, and not have any ambitions when it comes to circularity and to sustainability. Mm -hmm. Very good. Uh, on this point, Mathieu, uh, as, as a composite provider, you provide to various other industries. Yes. Um, how can we incentivize this, not only in the synergies there, but also the use of the material recovered? What, what, what is the role of industry and what is the role of government in this? I mean, you know, you have two points of view, yeah? You can have the stick or the carrots, obviously, yeah? I mean, uh, one thing that the wind industry did in Europe and in several countries stuck with, with, with the ban of landfill, which is, which is you know, one, one key step here. Um, but we need also to, to realize, as, as Alan is saying that we need critical mass and those feedstock need to reach a certain standard and be usable in, in other industries as well. Yeah? We have a good example. I mean, we generate a product today which is in the market, which is PET based. Our feedstock is actually coming from mainly from the food industry. Yeah? It's pure PET packaging. So having the ability to tag along another industry or other industry tag along the feedstock we are creating is actually crucial to be able to do that. But the pool, most of the time, comes through some kind of incentive to generate that stability of a feedstock to reach there. So we need the help of government to do that. And also another element which we know, transport is particularly expensive, which leads that that those loops are regional. Means by definition that we need to make sure that the supply chain remains within a region to be able to re reuse those feedstock. If you are not protecting the supply chain at the regional level, you will have nobody to use those feedstock. So again, legislation needs to help us to maintain those industries. Mm -hmm. I, see, I see you nodding intensely, life. Anything to complement there? just wanted to underline by nodding. I think this is perfectly right. We need a health, uh, healthy supply chain and, and material industry in the region because the material industry uh, and the material providers are also key to achieve recycling and circularity. Mm -hmm. Very good. One question that always, always, invariably comes up when we talk about circularity and composites and blades how circular can those products be? Yeah? Can we go from blade to blade, take it down, process it, and bring it back up? Uh, Guillaume? Yeah, what that's see? what we uh, intend to prove the last few years with uh, what we call the Zebra Project, with our partner, uh, Owen Scorning, Element Power, uh, Suez, NG, and some French uh, technical institutes, uh, T. Jules Verne and Canoe. And basically, we started in 2020, if I remember well, already a long time ago, about four years ago, uh, a, a project to uh, design uh, new blades out of uh, liquid thermoplastic resin and to demonstrate the recycling of both the uh, um, production waste and end of life material by uh, various uh, methods according to the, the, the tonnage that we will uh, meet. And we were pretty successful to do that and uh, to prove the, the, the efficiency to uh, reincorporate uh, compounds made of uh, uh, composite waste in a new blade or even remelt the glass fiber or uh, recollect the resin monomer from the resin to uh, uh, formulate new resin again with exactly the same properties that's uh, what we uh, already uh, deliver to the business. Yeah, very good. Very interesting. You mentioned there the remelting. So then, then Tom, I think that's directly addressed to you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think I, I agree with you that um, we believe as well in 100% circularity. 
Um, over the last years, we have made tremendous progress <coughs> in remelting glass, which is something which is very sensitive because it's a 24-7, 15 years operation. So you need to make sure that your input material is very consistent in order to have this uh, production uh, running and, and, and efficient. Um, for us, there is different levels of waste. So the, our own basement waste, we already reuse and remelt for several years. The next step for us was to prove that we can actually take back waste, which is still glass fiber, but when we deliver our glass fiber, not all of that ends up in the, in the, in the blade. So we take all of that, which is over cut waste, uh, production waste, we have proven successfully that we can take that back and remelt that again and use that as part of the feedstock for our virgin materials. Um, the next step we have as well proved on a lab scale today is actually that we can take back composite waste from the customer, maybe trimming waste or something which comes from the operation of the customer. We have to go through a recycling process, we have to go through pyrolysis or cyrolysis. But again, we have at lab scale proven that we can remelt glass coming out of those recycling processes so that we are preparing ourselves to ramp up uh, with a portion of the input of a furnace within the region that we can remelt industry waste through the chain. And if we are at that point, I think the next step will be to test the end of life waste, where for us it's the highest uncertainty and, and unclarity what is actually in that feedstock. And we, um, Matt was talking about standardization of pooled chains of waste back. I think that's very important for us as well to have still a consistent product, production process, and as well performance of our products. That's very inf important for us to have a standard of what this waste we take back will be. Very good. I'm, I'm trying to connect a few dots here. So, um, with Arkema, you're working on, I'm going to be simple, a recyclable resin. Um, Life, Alan, with the CTEC project, you're also working on a way of where you can reuse uh, the resin and create new epoxy resins um, from the project. Tom, you are remelting the glass fibers. So, we are, and I'm summing this up then, are we then on the pathway where we are able to take down our blades and provide input materials to a variety of other sectors? And that maybe the question is not, does it go from a blade to a blade, but that it goes from a blade to any new product made of composites. Alan, maybe any thoughts on this? And then yeah, Tom? I think it's, <laughs> that's, that's uh, I think blade to blade, uh, I also, uh, mentioned it before, not necessarily, it does not have to go from, from blade to blade. The, the first thing, of course, we can do when you take a blade down, that is to refurbish it and sell it again. That's the best thing to reuse it. And we do that to a very large extent, investors already. But when, then when we do have the materials, then I think we should try to use them in the shape they have. Because to be very honest, there are two things that we are, that's a challenge here. One thing is that the existing material streams are extremely efficient when it comes, for instance, to glass fiber manufacturing. And the second thing is that s until now, with the technologies we have, with the approach we have, there is still, it's still relatively high energy. We need to, to take the fibers out and get them back into a, a wind turbine again, for instance, where we are, we are relying on all the strengths, the tensile strengths we can get from, from these materials. We cannot directly use them again because that's uh, that's that's not possible at the moment. So so we need to get get through some steps, reuse, and then perhaps uh, get them back into the loop as as new glass. Uh, or what do I know? But it's very important that we in this uh, stream of materials are not going to pollute them. So for instance, put them into concrete. If we're talking about glass fiber, we need to do some other things. I don't know non-wovens, for instance, that could be a way, and then get them back. So we get all the energy, how to say it, all, as much as we can out of the materials while they are here. Mm. Very good point. So I'm, I think I'm going to come back to this, uh, this question about energy intensity of the processes and the overall picture. I'll come back to that. But before that, um, we touched upon it in the beginning, you know, scaling up the, the recycling value chain. That's one element. But maybe the broader question is, how are we doing in the supply chain of composites itself? 
if we are going to install more and more. What are the are there any potential bottlenecks that we can see now in our in our industry? Um, and maybe <clears throat> Mathieu, Tom, and uh, Guillaume, maybe you can you can give some some initial thoughts on this. I mean, at the end of the day, if we look into the wind energy. Um, all providers here of, 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 of the composite can scale. Yeah, I mean, they, they, there's not a, an issue with that. The business case is there. Uh, on the recent years, it's really about visibility and stability of the demand. Yeah, I mean, we've been through uh, different waves, up and downs, um, and, and this is particularly challenging. So at the end of the day, we need to uh, work close to our partners, the, the OEMs, to be able to understand how they are developing that. In terms of mitigation, um, I mean, at least at Gurit, we, we have a view that as soon as we have the volume, we need to work on the regional level, which has the ability to, to temper the bit those, those waves, yeah? because all, not all the region uh, 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 pool uh, at the same time, create a redundancy into the, the supply chain um, and, and allow us also to be, to a certain extent, uh, um, uh, closer to, to, to that uh, energy efficiency. Yeah? We don't try to ship things from mm -hmm. other side of the world all the time. Yeah? But at the end of the day, the first one is visibility. Mm -hmm. Very good. And of course, many of the good facilities are very close to the consumers, uh, sometimes in the same allotment park. So that's very good. Guillaume? Yeah, and uh, as a newcomer in this business, we had to uh, install immediately uh, a global industrial footprint to be able to serve the same quality of resin uh, everywhere it's, uh, it's needed. Mm -hmm. So we uh, installed new production capacity, of course, first in Europe, then immediately after in, in Asia, then in, uh, in Americas. Uh, it, it was... Mandatory, I mean, to be, uh, to be uh, 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 relevant in this uh, type of business, to, be, uh, to have this, uh, this uh, global position, uh, otherwise the, 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 the adoption of the, of the solution would be very, uh, very limited. Mm, very good. Tom, do you want? Well, I, I agree with all what has been said so far. I think a, a bottleneck for me to come most likely very soon when we talk about circularity is actually that we can keep the value chain in the region. Because I think whenever the products of our customers will be made more and more with imported materials, the less capacity of the material chain will sh stay in the region. Mm. And it may come to the point that no matter of the four of us sitting here will have actually capacities remaining in Europe and then the waste chain is established and uh, we have uh, perfect partners in the industry to bring us the waste but we have no operation anymore in Europe. That can happen. Uh, it's not far away I would say and to the point I've met before about the obligation we hope to have from associations and governments and regulators will help us to remain a critical mass of supply and capacities for the materials of our customers to build wind turbines, uh, that we can uh, maintain the business in the shape and then the beauty as it is today in Europe. Mm -hmm. Very good. Uh, may maybe just to harp in on this, uh, this front and then I'll, I'll play my role as a moderator again. But we have in, in, in Europe, or at least in the European Union, we have the Wind Power Action Plan you know, announced by the, uh, by the European Commission, uh, President Ursula von der Leyen, with exactly that aim, right? Make sure that wind energy in Europe is made in Europe with a European supply chain uh, from the tip of the turbine blades all the way to the foundation and all the materials in between and components as much made in Europe. Of course, recognizing that we are in a globalized economy and that globalized supply chains for all of you is a, is a, is a matter. Um, maybe one, one quick round question is, Apart from setting targets and you know incentivizing, what is the best way to incentivize that that regional approach? What what do you think is something? Well, no, this is something that governments should do to promote this regional uh, regionalization. I think I think uh, I don't want to talk about regulations because I'm not an expert at all. But in my mind, 
it can only work and be sustained for the industry if it really comes through the entire chain. That means for me that it goes even beyond Alan. It goes maybe two steps further down that you actually incentivize regional production and value brought into the region. Um, it, I don't think it will help to break in the chain somewhere and make some regulation in between. I think it has to go through the end of the use and the utilization of what we are building together. Does anyone else have a follow-up oh, idea? Actually, I, I would agree very much with what, what, what Tom said. It's basically we need to realize that, that if we call for local content on a certain level of a value chain, yeah, but we, we, we don't realize the same for the, for the upstream value chain. Yeah? Basically, everything we are doing is moving dependency from one step to another. So I, I very much agree. I mean, this needs to cover the, the entire value chain. Mm. The, and there is probably, um, it's, and I fully agree, but it's also very difficult to apply and we need to realize that because um, some of the aspect on that value chain has never been there in the first place or, or it's not there anymore. So it's, it's local content for me is crucial, but you need a very deep insight to do it properly. Otherwise you put an over, overall bo heavily burden on the whole industry, which at the end of the day doesn't help anyone. Mm -hmm. yeah? So uh, local content, but we need to do it in a very clever way. In a clever way and with insight, Alan, as the wind turbine manufacturer, you're maybe the apex, not apex predator, but apex company uh, here of this value chain here on the on the panel. What would your what would your vision be on how we let's say coordinate within the supply chain um, in order to to meet up the demands? You know, what is what are the tips and tricks that you are applying, for instance, in Vestas? I think we are, how to saying, I guess uh, all of us, uh, we, all, we already face, uh, how to say it, uh, requirements to have local content. I think it's easy for us to sit here and say uh, we would like to have local content, but I think there is a scale we need to have, we, we also need to, 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 to have in mind here because it's, it's true when we talk about su sustainability and circularity, we, where we have these blades, we put them down, we recycle them. We don't want to transport them far because, I don't know, this value chain is not really efficient. We don't want to pay for it. It's, it's waste. But when it comes to getting virgin raw materials, we would like, then, then scale is also s supporting us to get very, very cheap materials. Mm -hmm. so, so yes, if we, are, if, if we are going to have the recycling very locally, and to me locally, when we are talking about driving materials around, uh, waste materials, that's like a a circum circumference of 300 kilometers or so, because then, then it starts to be too expensive to, 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 to transport waste. But when we, when we talk about uh, companies making glass fiber or carbon fiber, it's huge entities, uh, huge factories, uh, and, and it has a lot much higher value of these uh, materials. And there's huge investments, investments in these factories, and you cannot really localize them without really giving, getting, uh, it will give a huge impact on the cost of the wind turbines in this case, and for you and I and all in this room for the electricity we pay. And then the question is, are we willing to, to pay that extra for, for electricity? I, I don't know if we are there yet. So there is, there is like a, a it's, it's bipolar, the, the wishes here and, and what can be done and, and the cost. Mm. I think for every sector and for everything in our lives, we want our cake and we want to eat it, right? But it's not possible. So yeah, indeed we need to make perhaps some, some choices or at least make some choices in the short term to have a long-term vision where the toast to meet, where it is sustainable, made in Europe, and, exp and cheap, and at the same time, profitable for everyone. Yeah? But that's, uh, that's indeed a journey that we're embarking on. One thing perhaps that's going to change a bit is the CBAM. So I, I assume it's going to change how we source materials and what we get into Europe, and, and perhaps also make co local content. And local, to me, is like Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, more viable. Yeah, at least creating a, a level st playing field on, on sustainability. Yeah, very good. Peter, you wanted to come in on, on, on the previous point, I think. Yes, um, as a recycling representative here, I uh, object a little bit to the term of waste. Um, we need to, as a society, uh, especially with a European approach, move away from this 
thinking of waste, but as a raw material. And consequently, we have to think about who is paying for the generation of this raw material, which was waste, but is made into a new raw material. And blade to blade is certainly a, a very, very high target, but most likely on some of these components, especially as the blades get bigger, more complex, composite industry, more different things, more difficult for the recycling industry to separate and to provide virgin quality material, we need to think how to move those into a second life, which is probably not the same level as the original product. We have to accept that to a certain point, I think. Mm. Does it also mean more close dialogue between the various elements in, this, in the value chain to create circular solutions that are circular by design that we, that we all also, all of you and your peers are in that same discussion? Is that, is that the way, one of the way forward that there is a very close dialogue within the, the various elements in the value chain? Well, it, I think it makes a lot of sense if, if the, the producers and the end users and the final recyclers talk to each other early on. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we are in a free market and we're also in a creative market. And I understand that you want to make blades longer, there's economy of scale. I understand that you want to differentiate yourself from the next producer. But me as a recycler, I would like to have one blade length, one material, and that's it. And then we have 100% recycling. <laughs> Duly noted, but uh, to, to be seen if that wish comes true uh, at one point. I think Tom and then uh, Guillaume, you guys wanted to come in on this. Yeah, I, I think um, I, I agree that we have to look as well in parallel about repurpose of material. While for me, the aim should still be the circularity. Otherwise, we would probably stop somewhere. And, and I don't think we should do that. Um, but as well, we in, in, in on Sconing, we, we start to look into repurposing. We have a fully integrated company and we have a lot of products. So there is opportunity as well to take waste back from the industry. Maybe not only wind, but multiple industries. And we have outlets of products for multiple industries. I think the, the, the repurposing of materials is, is a add-on, which is adding value to the entire situation. Still, I believe at some point we need to be ready as well to take back the materials, remelt it and produce high-performing products again, which then Alan likes to use. Mm -hmm. We come to recyclable blades by using recycled content in all the materials. Guillaume? Yeah, uh, and we, we, we see the, the deep change in, uh, in the way we uh, develop and commercialize material today. Uh, and it's very important for all the actors in the supply chain to understand the complete supply chain and each of each of the of the actors mm -hmm. and, and the value chain doesn't stop after the primary use of the material anymore we have to uh, uh, also uh, introduce the secondary use and, and be sure we are in the very beginning of the supply chain and for us the, the end use uh, the the job of the of the wind turbine uh, manufacturer is is a bit uh, a bit far. We have to understand exactly what are your your constraints and uh, and your needs, uh, and, and and then also uh, to to create new material and be sure that the the uh, the waste that the industry or the value chain will generate uh, uh, has been meant to be a new resource uh, to feed again the existing supply chain or new opportunity. Yeah, very good. Before I give the floor to the audience for questions, which undoubtedly you have already five in your mind, but please hold them off for a moment. Before we go to, to you, uh, I want to get a quick fire round uh, on, and I was inspired by, by Alan's point on mentioning of the energy intensity of the processes and that challenge, which brings us back to an, a debate that sometimes is waging, where do we go for sustainability, low environmental impacts, or for recycling and circularity at a moment where maybe in the short term, they may not be always aligned. Yeah? So based on that framework, uh, I want to go, and I will start from Peter and work my way down here. What is, according to you, the the biggest 
impact, environmental impact in the composites, uh, in the composites value chain that we need to address first? Oh, big question. Um, I think the, the biggest thing like Wind Europe did is to try to really prohibit landfilling. We need to understand that we cannot landfill such valuable material. And then further down the chain, I'm the mechanical guy who crushes it, but we need the process people, we need the chemistry people to find a uh, value added for that product that we try to provide. Mm -hmm. All right, Tom. I'm not sure if I can add a lot, but I think that a value for the industry is actually the technology innovation we are bringing through the mindset of building circularity. I mean, remelting glass, building blades out of thermoplastic resins, having several of these processes which actually crack the product to the monomers which can be reused. I think all this technology innovation coming from, from this activity around the table here, I think will benefit the overall industry. Alan? I think uh, it's 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 a bit uh, an extension of what was uh, Peter said. Uh, it is it is the scale of economy that's important here, and it's true. Uh, you, you didn't like the word waste, but but I think so far it's still an it, it's still an issue that perhaps we use the the word waste, and we will do that as long as we have to pay money to get rid of it. But I foresee that or I think. Uh, that when we grow in scale, then the, then the, then you also enter into a situation where you can actually, uh, how to say it, you want to buy these resources. Then to me, it's not waste anymore. But when we have these small amounts, then there is a supply demand issue. So if you have, if you're relying on a specific component that could be recycled glass and you can't get it, um, then you don't want to start an industry using it, will you? And that, that, that's the big. I think that that's that's one of the challenges right now. And as long as you don't really can rely on a stable supply due to the scale, then it's likely going to still to be waste, and you still like to pay money to get rid of it. So we need to enter. Uh, we need to have a, a, the scale on it. Yeah, we and that is when Europe, and that is uh, the European Union uh, legislation, who need to support uh, support us and other industries to get the scale. So trying to get out of that catch twenty two situation right now. Well, there's a lot of noise uh, to my right, which I hope is... I hope there's a, still a reception plan, and that's the catering. If not, I will be very disappointed. Um, now that they're quiet, live, uh, on to you. Yeah, let me, let me make two comments. I mean, the first, uh, the question was around sustainability impact of composite materials. And I mean, hey, we're all here in the room. Let's not be shy. Composites have a huge positive impact on sustainability. Yeah, it's renewable energy. It's uh, topics like hydrogen storage. You see multiple of, of uh, hydrogen pressure vessels here on the show. It's lightweight automotive. It's uh, sustainable construction materials like composite rebars. Uh, so composites are doing a lot uh, for sustainability and decarbonization. Um, of course, if it comes to the end of li life, um, it's, it's the topic to work on and, and to develop on. And I mean, in the end, yes, we need to be mindful that whatever we do in recycling needs to make sense. Uh, from a carbon footprint perspective. Um, and this is another reason why we need economy of scale. Yeah? It's basically if you operate several small plants, um, this will not be sustainable from a recycling energy consumption perspective. So we need to bring it to scale. Uh, we need to centralize waste. And this is also one of the reasons why, why um, I truly believe in, in circularity. You need to have a fit between the, the, the waste volumes that you are taking in the capacity of the recycling process, and also the output volume. Yeah, and for me, this means really circularity, bringing materials back into the same applications uh, is one of the keys. Very good. Mathieu? Yeah, but also confirming and what, what have been said before, I mean, we, we, we all heard that the, the COP28, the two main thing was triple renewable, yeah, I mean, clearly. And the second one was uh, energy efficiency. Yeah, it's exactly what Composite does in all the application. Yeah. And also on, on, on the energy aspect and the end of life. I mean, energy recovery is one step. And I think that can help us short term, but it's definitely not the end of the journey. We need to be able to convert what we have at the end of life as a feedstock, uh, which is usable across different applications. Yeah. Very good. Guillaume, 
Yeah, and last word, difficult to uh, to talk after all, all uh, my colleagues, but yeah, and, and we we also uh, seen uh, a, a great effort of all the composite industry also to uh, uh, collect data, to uh, to feed some LCA all along the value chain with great exchange about the different actors and, and cross the different value chain of of the composite material in order to uh, have a predictable future and or will be the uh, uh, efficiency uh, and energy efficiency of the of the industry in the next 10 and 20 years so it's a great indicator of of the the growth of our, of the of the composite industry in uh, in the future and, and that's uh, something that we really keen on uh, to to develop even much more very good a yes no question and then we go to the audience you mentioned lcas have you done an LCA of your products? Yeah, we provide LCA uh, of our material cradle to gate and try to gather uh, what, what we done in a, in a zero project together with NG and we yeah. uh, uh, charge the end user to uh, collect all the data to uh, have the most reliable uh, LCA of our business case together with, uh, with Owens Calling in the uh, That was a long yes, but <laughs> Mathieu. Yes, we do. Yes, you do. Live. Yes. Alan. Yes, and you can find them public available on our homepage. You can find them all on the homepage. That's true. Yes, oh. we do for our customers. Peter? I would say it doesn't apply, but as a company, we do have a sustainability report, of course, and it's a, a big topic because it is enforced through the whole value chain, I think, for mm -hmm. everybody. You cannot escape from it. Very good. Now I hope I've given the audience a few more ad added minutes to think about the question. Uh, if the lights dim a bit, I can see the hands go up if you have a question and the people from Jack will come with you with a microphone. Don't, don't be shy, it's the last, uh, you will only have the last word. Well, I see, well, I see Justine there with, the, with her hand up. <laughs> yes, is it on? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so my name is Justine Bosson from DTU Wind. Um, I have a PhD in blade recycling. So thank you for the discussion. I think it's very well summarized all the challenges we have in recycling blades. Um, but knowing, for example, that uh, we have difficulties in pulling the, the waste, uh, having enough waste volumes, how do you see the situation today where we developed many different kinds of recycling solution, new resins, different types of resins that will need different types of recycling solutions. Are we not spreading too much? How, how will it be in 25 years? And are we helping that future or are we making it more complex? Mm. Very good question. Who would you like that question to address? I don't know if somebody wants to. <laughs> I'm sure somebody feels compelled Alan, and then I Peter. Can, I think uh, I'm not from the chemical industry, so it's a bit more free for me to say something here. Uh, no, it is. Uh, it's it's true that that is that is a big issue, and and uh, of course I can point in our own direction with the CTEC project where we have developed a solution where we can actually make the existing uh, epoxy circular, and. And we truly believe in that investors, simply because we think it is a challenge that you add a specific um, uh, proprietary resin into a blade that's recycled, or there will be a few of them in 30 years from now that needs to be recycled, and there is no value chain or technology set up to do it. So what will happen in reality? I think these blades will enter into whatever recycling uh, processes that, are, that will be at that time. So, um, so I think it is, it, is, it is an issue when we make a lot of different materials that need their own specific technology to be recycled. And I will point to the CTEC here uh, and, and, and the approach that we've taken, uh, recycling of existing epoxies, also in a circular fashion. Uh, Peter? Yeah, I think I hinted at that before. From a recycling point, you're absolutely right. One resin, one type of blade, one type, one type, one type. Uh, not realistic, uh, certainly an oversight 20, 20, 30 years ago when the wind industry started. But going forward, I believe it should be a, a discussion 
where we go and how many different types we need to use. I understand that different suppliers have the proprietary recipes and formulas and even engineering in the blades. But on the recycling point, we need to, to reflect that. And as a society, we probably need also to accept that there's not always full recycling possible, that we have some products which are only applicable for downcycling. Not wasting, still having in another product, but maybe I'm just saying a simple comparison going from a turbine blade to a beer bottle. Um, maybe there's something. We recoup the energy, we recoup a lot of the resources, but we cannot be at the wind turbine level forever. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, I hope that answers part of your, of your question, uh, Justine. Of course, it is a young industry, the recycling, composite recycling industry, so it's maybe too soon to pick, to pick winners, and it's more the market that will decide, of course, which one will be those uh, winning technologies. Um, I, I see some trends, and some of the announcements from the companies here on the panel also give some indication, I think, of where it is heading. A second question there, I think a lady in a turquoise blouse, I think. Hi, my name is Stella Job from Graysbrook Innovation. I would be interested to hear what the panel have to, th have to say about the idea of making old blades into things like bike shelters, foot bridges, electric vehicle charging shelters, so reuse application, because mm. there are different paradigms of looking at sustainability, of course, reduce, reuse, recycle, reuse seems good, but then you're locking up the materials which could potentially be used in a new, a new situation. Have any of you done any LCAs which evaluate that? I'd be interested in your comments. Very good. So the question is on what we would call repurposing of, of blades. Um, any particular views on that? Because we have talked a lot about recycling, which is one our strategy. We've hinted at recovery, which is another. Reuse, repurposing is another. Um, my, I'm going to slightly rephrase that question and then say, if we think about volumes long term, how viable will those art strategies related to repurposing be? Um, and the, anyone in the panel feels compelled? I guess it will be a challenge because it's not very predictable. And I, if you start with some very nice projects about bridges or shelters or whatever, at some point you will face the question, do we need so many of those? <laughs> and I think for me, the second aspect of that is, I mean, it's certainly nice, it's, it's good to have, but it's actually a scale of one. And then in the lifetime of this second application, we still don't have the technologies to recycle and we can go to landfill from there. Mm -hmm. So that's why I think it's more important to bring the technologies for some sort of recycling, no matter if it's blade to blade or maybe blade to bottle or blade to nestle, uh, um, would add more value than thinking only about repurpose of the blades itself as a structure for some nice applications. I think it would get not get far too far. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, for us, it's a bit difficult to to comment on repurposing a certain shape. We, we, it's difficult for the composite industry. What we sell is property on any shapes. That's actually what we sell. So if we go on the repurposing, it's, it's, you need to go and, and ask the question to other industry that may have a need for a, mm -hmm. a, a long spa of equis property at the end of primary life. Yeah? And, and there is case on, on uh, uh, footpath bridges, they, they, there is case like this. But for us selling composites and selling multiple of shape and formability, it's really difficult to comment. Yeah? We, yeah. we will, by definition, try to go a step down to use a, all the level down of fit stock that can be created by recycling. Yeah? This is where we can add value. Mm. With Alan and then Peter. Yeah, I think uh, repurposing is uh, it's, it's fine, but it, there is no scale in it. That, that would be my approach. But what we actually do in Vestas is that we refurbish blades. We can get all the blades we can get our hands on, old Vestas blades. We refurbish these guys and we uh, install them again. So we, actually, we are very, very active in repurposing in Vestas. Mm -hmm. 
very good. Peter. Yeah, um, repurposing, in my opinion, is certainly a very complementary aspect, but looking at the numbers, Wind Europe is predicting about 60,000 tons of blades annually coming back, if I'm correct. Tons. Plus tons. minus. Yeah. Um, okay. So that is one part, but the composite industry as a whole produces 1.5 million tons of material every year. So um, I think it can only be a very small application. And um, I don't know if you have a chance to visit the Wind Europe um, conferences. There are several, on all of them, there are several um, suppliers or exhibitors who are in this exact repurposing business. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, thanks for the shout out. It's in two weeks in Bilbao if you want to book your tickets. Um, but indeed, repurposing, I think in the short term, it is definitely uh, an option. And indeed, we are several companies doing that. One additional concern to scalability is responsibility. Yeah, We are bringing it into a very technically difficult material to recycle. We're bringing that to a domestic appliance, if it is benches, yard furniture, etc., which is putting a lot of burner on maybe smaller owners with limited financial resources that would have then a burden for dealing with this material another 20, 30 years down the, down the line. So any repurposing project, I think, should also think about extended producer responsibility from that respect. And that is always a very, very touchy topic. But it's a very good question as part of the wider R strategies being applied uh, to, to blades in particular. Is there a, there is time for a final question. If there is a brave soul in the audience, Yes, there is. Well, there are two. Perfect. If, if the question is sufficiently short, we can have maybe 12 questions. Yes, I can make it short. Um, can you comment on um, designing for damage tolerance and lifetime extension? Because that can also help to offset the volume of uh, recycling that we'll have to do. Very good. Um, if I got the question correctly, I mean, one thing I can already say is that we see that the turbines are lasting much longer than their designed lifetime, and lifetime extension is the first choice by, by all operators. Um, I, think, I think it's in the Decom Blades project, they calculated it's the guarantee of lifetime plus nine years, and then you start decommissioning turbines. Um, but any particular points, maybe on from a material perspective on this? I think uh, I think yeah, the, right now I think the average lifetime we made the calculation on the installations in Europe is 29 years or so and they are pretty durable these these blades and and I think I, th I also think that so and we design them durable and we ask for materials that makes them durable uh, and the, the 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 if we're going to to design in a fashion so we have to add more materials then we will get we will get that punish from the rest of the construction then we have to add more steel in base frames in drive trains in towers and concrete in the foundation. So it's also important for us to make it light. And I, I still think we've proven that they're pretty durable, these plates. Mm -hmm. Very good. And then the final question is the gentleman there on my left, second row, no, third row, penultimate person. Uh, and please state your name and affiliation uh, when raising um, the question. Thank you. Name Yashin Vipaka. Uh, I'm from Suzlon, India. and. Uh, there's a question uh, on this one that uh, everyone talked about recycling the blades. That's a finished product. But prior to recycling the blades, when you're making the blades, that time also there's a tremendous amount of waste generated, sometimes about 20 kilos or 20 percent of the blade mass. So there was no talk on that. And one wished to understand that uh, what are the measures being taken on that? That was one part. The second part is uh, a question. It's directly directed to Alan because he said that uh, the blades can be repurposed and reused, but generally blades are made for a certain life and they're designed just right for that. So how is that done? Uh, that is pretty interesting to know. Mm, okay. So I think the second question is a very simple one. So when you refurbish the blades, how do you get them recertified for a certain amount of additional lifetime? 
Yeah, we actually don't have to recertify them when we refurbish them in our own facilities that are already certified to, to make this. So that's one of the advantages. We do the same with nacelles and, and, and other components. So, so no recertification is necessary. We get the data on what the tear and wear these have, plates have faced from uh, SCADA data. So, so we, ha we can estimate the remaining lifetime in them. Mm -hmm. And if it's not done by companies like Vesa themselves, there is a vibrant second-hand market, and then those turbines uh, and their components get recertified, uh, and they get 15, 10, 20 years uh, of a guaranteed lifetime sometimes. And the first question, if I recall correctly, was... Yeah, if we could bring the microphone, because it really just slipped from my mind. It's on the back uh, of my tongue. The waste? Uh, the manufacturing waste. The manufacturing waste, yes. yeah. So how, do, how are we dealing with that? I mean, it's a significant, uh, significant portion. Um, the numbers that I've had from companies that are not on this panel uh, is sometimes in mass to the final product. It can be 30, can be 40%, including all the consumables, the cardboard, the wrappings, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so how are we dealing with, with that is one part, but what are we doing with the composite cutoffs and the glass fiber cutoffs from, um, from, the, from the manufacturing? I, I hear that the very first recycling projects, a lot of them in Spain, are primarily feeding off of this, let's say, clean waste of manufacturing facilities. Um, but are there any additional points uh, I know, Alan, I've, I, I read your corporate sustainability report each year. Uh, there's a wonderful graph on, on waste, uh, re waste reduction there. Uh, maybe you can ha highlight something on that, perhaps? No, I, I can say we, we do work a lot on, on the factory waste. But just a company like Vestas produces, uh, if you can say so, hundreds of thousands of uh, tons annually from our factories and factory waste. And uh, we handle it locally because we have to tap into local value chains. Uh, I think we've done that with great success so far. Uh, we are recycling, I can't recall, between 65 to 70 percent of the materials we have in our, uh, from our factory. So I think that that's a success. Then, of course, we also want to reduce the waste or the, the waste we generate in general. We do that together with our suppliers that are sitting here. Um, also, suppliers in between, for instance, when we do nesting, they have huge amounts of glass fiber. Uh, material that's really clean, they are recycled. So, uh, we, we, have, we have a huge focus on that also because there is a cost uh, incentive to reduce the waste we generate from our factories. Uh, and, and we don't want to buy material, uh, virgin materials that we discard. And those we, we do discard, we want to recycle it. Mm -hmm. And I can, I can encourage reading the corporate sustainability reports from our, from our wind turbine OEMs uh, on this. The, the ambitions are very clear. And if there's a graph, it always goes very nicely down, which is, uh, which is very nice. Uh, we are over time, so I will try to wrap up the panel in four key words that I heard throughout the answers. Uh, the first is value. Composites have value in their current application, and they have value at the end of their life. They're not a waste. We should see them as a resource, as a new raw material. The second is scale. We need to scale up in installations. We need to scale up in the supply chain. We need to scale up in our recycling supply chain. Scale up, scale up, scale up. But we need to do so, and that's the third keyword, in a regionalized approach. It, small scale, national level, that's too small. Global scale, that is not going to give us the, the transparency and the action at the same time. Uh, is also maybe not the most sustainable way of thinking about the value chain giving all transportation costs and the environmental impacts associated with that. And that brings us to the last key word, which is collaboration. Collaboration within the industry, within this supply chain, collaboration with other composite material using sectors, working together to develop circular solutions and make sure that the material flows stay within our, uh, within our sectors so that we reduce the opportunity for labeling composite materials at the end of their life as being waste, but that they are constantly used as a resource within the industry. And so with those four words, value, scale, regional, and collaboration, I wish you a very nice last few hours at Jack World, and thank you very much for joining us. Thank you.